I'm sorry. Let's see if I can close out of this. Okay, and we are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our session today. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Ar Do Oops, sorry, Dr. Aruwari, who will be teaching us about breast cancer surgery. As always, please remember that the Google form will be posted in the chat box and in the description of this video at the end of the session. And please stick around for an announcement about our April roundup that is happening this weekend. Um, with that being said, Dr. Aruwari, get started whenever you're ready. Okay, I'm sorry. I have, I could text message thing that keeps popping up. I hope you guys are not seeing that. No, we're not, don't worry. Okay, good. All right. Hi, everybody in uh, Web Shadow Land. I am Dr. Oruweri. I am a breast surgeon, oncologic breast surgeon. So I do um, everything breast related. So uh, I am just going to start off with uh, telling you a little bit about what it takes to be where I am to be a breast surgeon. Um, you start with four years of college. At some point during your college, your college career, you're gonna take the MCAT. I'm not even sure what the scores are today to get into med school, but you know, it's gotta be a good score to get into med school. And once you get into med school, uh, there's four years of that, and it could be either an MD program or a DO program. Um, then general surgery is five years. During the course of your five years, some of the programs want you to do um, some sort of research. I spent a year between my second and my third year doing uh, research in, uh, breast in breast surgery and breast cancer because I knew that's what I wanted to be. Uh, but a lot of times you're not gonna know what it is that you want to do. So uh, it's okay to do research in something, anything. It always looks good on your resumes uh, later on when you apply for fellowship. And uh, fellowships, uh, just extra training after residency. You do not have to do a fellowship, but if you want to specialize or self-specialize in surgery, if you want to do oncology, for instance, you would have to do a fellowship. If you want to do vascular surgery, you'd have to do a fellowship. Um, uh, urology, um, other surgical subspecialties, you'd have to do a fellowship, pediatric surgery, things like that. Otherwise, you can just be done at your five years and be a general surgeon and practice general surgery. But I would advise that unless you are going to practice in a rural area, it is um, important that you subspecialize because if you are a general surgeon practicing in a big city, you're not gonna be able to do a lot of things. For instance, you would not be able to do a lot of breast surgery because people like myself who are specialized in breast surgery are gonna be doing a lot of the breast. And same with um, things like gallbladders. Now the laparoscopic surgeons are doing that because they have extra fellowship training. So just keep that in mind when uh, if you're thinking of going the track of general surgery. And once you're done with your fellowship, they you have options for jobs. The options involve being employed at a teaching hospital. So you get to work with medical students and residents and do teaching and research and publish. Um, or you can be employed at a community hospital uh, where it's just a smaller hospital where they don't really do too much research or if they do research, a lot of it is what we call clinical research uh, instead of being in a lab. Um, or you can go into private practice where you can have partners. So you partner with other surgeons or other practitioners to have a practice. So you can uh, just be by yourself in practice. So that's private practice. There are pros and cons to all of them. And it just really depends on what you want. I have um, done both a little bit. I started off out of training in private practice with a bunch of other surgeons and oncologist, and that was great. We did that for a few years and then one of the hospitals bought our practice. So we were employed by them and again, that has its pros and that has its cons, but again, it depends on what kind of life you want. Um, so once you are out there practicing as a breast surgeon, um, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you're a breast surgeon. All you do is breast. It's so limiting and so limited. And 
you know, I really don't feel like it is uh, limited. I feel like I see a variety of things and the things that I see in my clinic range from people that come in with just breast pain, people that come in with lumps and bumps, people that come in with breast cysts, nipple discharge, masses in their axilla, uh, breast infections, uh, lesions of the skin of the breast, mammograms that are abnormal, people that have a family history of breast cancer who just uh, want to follow up because of their family history and people who come in for high risk screen screening. So um, our high risk patients are patients that have had breast cancer before a patient who have a strong family history of breast cancer or who we've tested and they have the gene for breast cancer. Those women are considered high risk. So we put them on a screening protocol and we follow them a few times a year. Uh, I also see patients who have breast cancer, not just women, because a lot of people think, again, breast, breast women, but men come in with lumps and bumps and breast cancer also. So um, I see men and women. Um, I see probably kids from the age of eight, nine to women in their 90s, hundreds. Uh, so all ranges. I'm pretty much not limited. So when I initially see a patient, we want to start with a breast exam. So the exam that we encourage all of our patients to do is a self breast exam. So this is something that we want women to do once a month, about a week after the period, because that's when the breasts are gonna be the least lumpy bumpy. And, um, I believe that, and it's pretty controversial, the self uh, breast exam. A lot of doctors don't think women should be doing their breast self exams. I think that they should be because a woman sees her doctor only once a year. So we have 11 months when you're not seeing anyone and nobody's checking. So it's important, I, I believe that uh, people check themselves monthly because you're gonna be able to find something in that in between time before you, before you see us back. And that's important for breast cancer because the earlier we diagnose the breast cancer, the more curable it is. Um, and then there's what we call the clinical breast exam, which is just done once a year by the gynecologist or your regular practitioner. And um, if you feel something or if your doctors feel something, then they will send you to me for evaluation. When a patient comes in to see me and their doctors have um, referred them to me because they felt a lump, the first thing I usually want to get done is a breast ultrasound. So an ultrasound is a type of test that uses ultrasound waves to evaluate the lump that we're feeling in the breast. So on the right is what we call a cyst. So a lot of lumps that we see are gonna be benign and um, cysts are benign. They're just fluid filled lumps in the breast. That whole black area you see in that black circle is fluid. And um, in this patient, it felt probably about the size of a grape or so, and it can be pretty painful. A lot of times just by examining and feeling, we can tell that it's a cyst, but the only way to tell for sure is to get the pictures because this lump on the right and the lump on the left can feel the same. So the ultrasound is what differentiates it. So on the right side, because that's a cyst, and now, the, now we want to prove that it's a cyst because it's full of fluid. We put a needle in and we're able to pull all of the fluid out and it will make the lump go away completely. So we know definitively that that's a cyst. On the left, we call that a solid mass because that's made up of all tissue. So if we put a needle in that lump on the left, we're not gonna be able to pull uh, any kind of fluid out. We're gonna be able to pull tissue out. So that's tissue that gets sent to the lab to be tested to see if it's a cancer. So that's what an ultrasound tells us. It tells us if the lump is a cyst or if the lump is solid. And then we also have our patients get mammograms. Mammograms are looking for lumps out of the ordinary in the breast. And mammograms are what we use routinely for screening women over 40. Um, so it's recommended that once you hit 40, you start getting mammograms once a year. A mammogram is gonna be able to pick up lumps that we cannot feel. That's the importance of screening because 
I don't ever want to see a patient in my office with a lump that I can feel. I want to find something before it becomes big enough to feel. So on the left, you have the arrows pointing to a lump. This is such a tiny lump that we could not feel, but it was found on the mammogram. And then on the right, you have what we call calcifications, kind of on the bottom part of the uh, picture. I don't know if, you, if it projects well, but you can see those little teeny tiny dots of white. We call those calcifications or calcium deposits. Those can be a sign of cancer. Whenever we see that, we worry. So a woman who has this on her mammogram would need a biopsy for us to test it to see what's going on. The other way that we evaluate the breast is an MRI. The MRI uh, uses magnetic resonance. Uh, it's called magne magnetic resonance imaging to get pictures of the breast. And it takes little teeny tiny slices of the breast and you get pictures that are almost three-dimensional, almost, um, almost uh, life uh, shape because it's in 3D. So you're able to find lumps in um, particular um, directions of the breast. And the, in the MRI pictures, the breast in this picture looks like it's hanging down. And that's because the woman is usually laying face down for a breast MRI. So um, it finds things even smaller than a mammogram would and even earlier. A lot of times when we screen somebody who is high risk, like someone who has a strong family history or someone who's genetically predisposed to breast cancer, we do it with MRI alternating with mammograms because we want to be able to pick up things sooner. So once we do the breast exam and then we do all of the imaging and we find things that we don't like, then we want to biopsy it because I don't want to guess just by looking at the pictures and I don't want to guess just by feeling the breast that something is going on. The only way to know for sure is pathology. And so we need to get tissue from the breast so that the uh, pathologist can look at it under the microscope. So on the left is what we call a needle core or a core needle. This is um, a bigger gauge needle than needles that we use to draw blood or to put IVs in. Um, we numb the skin, like the picture on the right, we numb the skin and then we pass the needle through the numb area and it goes right into the lump that we're concerned about. And it's designed in such a way that when we insert the needle and engage it, it takes a little cylindrical slice of the lump. So we're able to pull that out and that's what gets sent to pathology to be looked at under the microscope. So this is a really simple, very minor procedure. It's done in the office, it's done in the radio, radiology suite. And this is the way that we make about 95% of diagnosis for breast cancers by doing a needle biopsy. So this is something that I can do in the office. If I feel a lump, I can do this because I can feel the lump, but sometimes we cannot feel the lump. So we'd have to do it using either the ultrasound. So on the left is the ultrasound guided core needle biopsy. So we'll put the ultrasound probe on the breast and find the lump on the monitor. And then the, we'll direct the needle to where the lump is on the mammogram. Um, I'm sorry, on the ultrasound. On the right is a stereotactic core biopsy. So doing the similar thing that the ultrasound is doing, but this time we're using the mammogram. And this is for lumps that we see on mammograms and that we don't see on the ultrasound. So similar way, we'll numb the breast and we'll pass the needle through the numb area and take a sample and that goes to the lab to be tested. Another way to do a biopsy, if we cannot do a needle biopsy, we will do what's called a surgical biopsy. And all that means is that we're gonna take you to the operating room. We're going to give you some anesthesia. We're going to make an actual incision in the breast. With the others, we're putting a needle through the skin. So it's just a little tiny hole, but with this, we're actually making a cut. And then we're going in, finding the lump of the area and we're removing it. And all of it goes to the lab to be tested. So the main difference, like I like to tell my patients between doing a needle biopsy and a surgical biopsy is that the needle biopsy, you are awake for it with the surgery you're sleeping. 
With a needle biopsy, we're only taking a little piece of that lump. With the surgery, we're taking the whole thing. But the results we get are going to be the same because the tissue goes to the pathologist to test it to see what it is. So um, when we do the biopsy, we can either find things that are benign or things that are cancerous. We see like the list that I showed you in the beginning, we see a huge variety and a huge range of benign breast diseases. Um, probably about 80%, I would say 70 to 80% of what a breast surgeon sees is gonna be benign. So only about 25, 30% breast cancer. Um, so there, there are a lot of breast problems out there. So we'll th see things like nipple discharge, that's the top uh, picture here. Um, bloody nipple discharge. Uh, it could be milky discharge from the nipple or it could be watery discharge. Milky discharge, we don't typically worry about because a lot of that has to do with the hormonal changes that the breast goes through. So we don't worry about that. Um, clear discharge, a lot of times we don't worry about it, especially if it's coming out of both breasts because it's gonna be also hormonal changes. But if it's coming out of one nipple and it's coming out on its own and it's running out like tap water, then that's a problem. If it's bloody, then that's also a problem. Those indicate things that are called introductal papillomas that could lead to cancers. So if a woman comes to my office with discharge, uh, bloody or clear, comes out by its own, you don't have to squeeze for it to come out, then we need to do all of those evaluations and um, figure out is this cancer or is this something benign. Um, we see a huge, huge amount of breast pain. Breast pain is benign, it's not cancerous, it doesn't lead to cancer, but a lot of women because of the hormonal changes that they go through every month, the hormones stimulate the breast and it causes the breast to get engorged for a short period of time and that engorgement causes a lot of pain and soreness. So um, a lot of women worry about it because they're concerned, you know, my breast hurts, is this cancer, is this not? So they come. So a lot of times with breast pain, all we do really is get x-rays to make sure there's nothing bad going on. And then just a lot of reassurance for that. And then uh, the bottom picture shows breast abscess. That's an infection of the breast. The most common reason we see women with breast infections or breast abscesses are women who are breastfeeding or women who smoke. Um, it's really typically bacteria entering the skin, the breast and into the breast and causes an infection. As infection progresses, it develops a, a pus cavity and that's what an abscess is. And it's very treatable, but it has to be open and the uh, pus has to be drained. So the picture on the left shows an abscess. It's actually a minor one. Sometimes it involves a whole breast. So this something like this, we'll either do in the office, if it's small or if it's big, we'll go to the operating room. We'll just make a small cut uh, right on top of the area and release all of the pus. And we leave it open to heal from inside out. And on the right is what the result is. So it's pretty much back to normal. Um, Changes of the skin of the breasts, we see also commonly the picture on the right. Um, this woman came in and has this almost rash-like appearance to the skin of the nipple and the areola. This worries us sometimes, majority of the time it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be a dermatitis, it's gonna be eczema, things like that, or just dry skin. But sometimes depending on how it looks and a lot of times because of fact that I've been doing this for a long time, um, I'll say, you know what, we need to do a biopsy of this, which I'll take a little piece of the skin in the office and we'll test it to see if it's a type of cancer called Paget's, which is a cancer that can start from the skin around the nipple. So you just, a matter of knowing um, how these rashes present and what they, what it should look like normally versus what it shouldn't look like. Um, to see if it needs to be biopsied or not. And then as far as benign breast diseases, we see a lot of fibroadenomas. These are lumps. Now, as I mentioned that I see women or girls from the age of eight onwards. A lot of times when I see a girl who's eight, it's gonna be because she has a fibroadenoma. 
Fibroadenomas of benign lumps in the breast is pretty common from the age of eight to about mid twenties or so. They can be multiple, they can develop on both sides, they can get big real fast, they can be painful. And a lot of times we just end up removing them. So uh, let me talk about a couple of cases. Um, the first case is, um, it's gonna be a fibroadenoma. So I'm just give you the answer right off the bat. This is a 15 year old girl who came in with a lump in her right breast. Um, when she comes into the office, you want to make sure you're asking the right questions. You want to know how long it's been there. When did she first notice it? Has it grown? Is it painful? Does anything make it feel better? Does anything make it feel worse? And this particular case, she noticed it six months ago. She says um, that it hurts around her menstrual cycle, and that's pretty typical. Um, and she thinks it's gotten big over the past six months and uh, nothing makes it better, nothing makes it worse. So of course, because um, she's a young woman, we have to ask questions related to that. I'm not a gynecologist, but a lot of GYN crosses over into the breasts, so it's like puberty, et cetera. So we want to know things like, how old were you when you first started to menstruate? Have you been pregnant? Um, what's your family history of breast cancer? Have you had any previous breast surgeries or breast concerns? So uh, she's a, she started her periods at 11, no pregnancies. Her grandma had breast cancer when she was 65. The importance of that question is um, to know if there's a strong family history that I need to worry about. Yes, grandma having breast cancer is a strong family history, but I'm not super concerned about it because she was diagnosed in her 60s. But if grandma had breast cancer in her 30s and mom had breast cancer in her 30s, I'm gonna start worrying because the younger people are diagnosed, the more likely it is that it's genetic. So she's somebody that I will start to think about, do I need to do genetic testing on her to see if she has any of those genes that increase your risk or your likelihood for breast cancer. So that's why we ask those questions. And then have you had any prior breast surgeries? I'm just trying to ascertain if she's had this uh, issue before in the past, which some girls, even at this young age, may have had a previous one. So then um, I would have to examine her. She's healthy, she's fine, she's not in distress. Um, she has a two and a half centimeter mass in her right breast. I have here at four o'clock. We always wanna look at the breast like it's a clock. So, um, because that's how we communicate with each other. So if I say she has a mass at four o'clock on her right breast, the radiologist is gonna know what I said, the medical oncologist will know what I said, and we all kind of know what we're saying and where it's located. But she had nothing else on her exam. She had a breast ultrasound, which showed that she had a mass in her right breast, which um, was um, concordant with what we felt. And this is the mass, which uh, just looking at it, because I've been doing this a long time, I can tell you that that's a typical fibroadenoma but would need to biopsy it. So um, she would need a needle biopsy and um, the needle biopsy uh, shows that it's a fibroadenoma, which is a benign breast lump. So our options are to either leave it alone or to remove it surgically. Uh, some girls don't want to feel any lumps in their breast. They just want it gone. Some girls say, you know what? We've done the needle box and we know it's okay. Let's just leave it be. If it grows, I usually recommend that it be removed. Or if it starts to bother them or starts to become painful, then yes, we'd want to remove it. So that's how we manage someone who's young with a breast lump that turns out to be a fibroadenoma. Let's do a, a second case, a breast cancer case. This is a 45 year old woman she came in with a lump in her right breast. So of course we have to ask all those same questions again. Um, when did you notice the lump? Has it changed? Is it painful? Um, then we want her gynecologic uh, history and family history and prior surgery history. So she noticed this lump the week before. It hasn't changed in size. There's no pain. Um, she was 13 when she had her first period. She's had three pregnancies and she was 25 when she had her first birth. 
those questions we like to ask because um, it adds into some of the risk factors that we know for breast cancer. We know that uh, women who waited till after the age of 30 to have babies had a higher risk of developing breast cancer. And women who have never been pregnant also has a, have a higher risk of developing uh, breast cancer. So those are why we ask those questions. Her mom has had breast cancer and her sister had breast cancer. So she is uh, super high risk because mom and sister have had breast cancer. She hasn't had no prior breast issues herself. So um, she was examined. She had a one centimeter mass in her right breast at seven o'clock. Uh, it wasn't painful on exam. Um, I examined her lymph nodes under the arm and her lymph nodes above the clavicle bone here. And they were all fine. And that's a good thing because when breast cancer spread, the first place it was spread to are the lymph nodes under the armpit. So we always want to check that. So that's part of what we do at surgery. But I always want to check that um, on the exam also. So we got some imaging on her. We did the breast ultrasound, which shows on the right here. She's got um, the solid mass. So this is not a cyst like the picture I showed you earlier where we can put a needle in and drain fluid out. This is more of a solid lump. And then her mammogram, she had this lump here. So um, that's the, the, what we call a suspicious mass. And her MRI, you can't see this. I should have projected it bigger, but she's got an area here that's concerning uh, for breast cancer. So of course we did a biopsy then. And the biopsy, this is a pathology. Um, so as a breast surgeon, one, one of the things I like about being a breast surgeon is the fact that my field is multidisciplinary. What that means is that it's a discipline or it's a um, specialty that involves a whole lot of different doctors, not just me. So I work with uh, the pathologists. So they are the ones that make slides from the tissue that we give them. And this is a typical breast cancer slide. I also work with medical oncologists. So they're the ones that talk about whether or not the patient needs chemotherapy. Uh, radiation oncologists talk about whether the patient needs radiation. And we have plastic surgeons if we're talking about breast reconstruction. Um, I also work with, um, let's see, nurses, social workers, um, and just see what other type of doctors. Gynecologist, uh, sometimes a reproductive endocrinologist. If, uh, if it's a young woman who's gonna need chemo, because we know that chemo can throw women into menopause. So we want to see if we can talk about egg freezing before they got chemo so that they still have the op option to have babies later on. Oh, and uh, radiologists, we work with radiologists as well because they look at all our mammograms and MRIs and whatnot. Okay. So uh, the needle biopsy showed that she has breast cancer. So then we have a discussion um, as far as what are your options? What do we need to do to treat this breast cancer surgically? The options for surgery are lumpectomy, which just means that we're gonna make a cut. We're gonna go in and we're going to remove that cancer and remove some extra tissue around that cancer because we wanna get it all. And all of that tissue we remove goes to the pathologist who tests it to make sure that we got it all and that the margins are okay. When we do a lumpectomy, we're not taking enough to change the shape or size of the breast, just really enough so that we're getting the cancer and extra tissue to make sure we're not leaving anything behind. So everything looks pretty much um, like the other side except for the incision. We can also do on the bottom left, what's called a skin sparing mastectomy. So that means that we're going to take the nipple we're going to take the areola, but we're going to leave all the rest of the skin. We're going to go through that circle around the nipple and take the nipple, the areola, and all of the stuff on the inside. So um, it's almost like um, taking, a, taking a pillow out of a pillowcase. So we're leaving all the stuff on the outside, except the nipple and the areola. And in, this, in the bottom right, we're doing the same thing, except we're leaving the nipple and the areola. So we 
try to hide the incision. The most common way of hiding the incision when we do what's called a nipple spare mastectomy is we make the cut underneath the breast where we hide the incision and then take everything out from under there. Sometimes we make a small incision right around the areola and go through that incision. This is like probably the toughest surgery we do because it's hard to get all of that breast tissue out through a small hole, but somehow we do it. Um, and then the top right is a traditional mastectomy where we remove all of the breast tissue and what's remaining is um, just a little bit of skin that covers the muscles underneath because we're not taking the muscle and everything is flat. In the bottom two, we've done reconstruction. So once we remove the breast, we replace it with something. I'm gonna talk about that next. But in the top right, we we're not replacing it with anything. It's just a mastectomy, so everything is flat. So this is that traditional mastectomy where we removed uh, everything. So this woman had a bilateral or, or both side mastectomy. Uh, we usually put drains in like the picture on the right, the drain stays in for about a week or two and then we take them out. So they heal really nicely. Then women have an option to do breast reconstruction when we remove the breast. Um, and this is a picture of an, a breast implant. So the implants come either in silicone implants, which feel almost realistic like breast tissue, or they also come in saline implants. We had issues in the past with silicone implants. So a lot of women are kind of gone shy, but the implants today are safe. The silicone implants today are safe. So, so women are getting back to those. Otherwise uh, we have the saline implants, which is just really uh, saline filled. Um, uh, saline filled bag that we put in to replace the tissue that we removed. So um, if we don't use implants for reconstruction, we can use a woman's own tissue. We can use um, tissue from the belly. So uh, we can use fat and muscle from the belly, such as the pictures here depict, or we can use, um, I don't think we have that picture, but we can also use um, back, um, the, the tissue right above the scapula back here, we can take the muscle and the fat from there to reconstruct the breast. Uh, some specialized places do buttock tissue where they transpose tissue from the buttock or from the thigh and use that to reconstruct the breast. And the size of the breast that results really depends on what you have to start with. Some women have a lot more fat to work with, some women really don't. So there's some women who are very thin that are not good uh, candidates for, this, uh, for these procedures just because they don't have enough to make a breast. And uh, typically um, after the mastectomies and reconstructions, it used to be that we'll keep women overnight. Since COVID, we've been sending women home the same day and they actually do quite well with this surgery. So this is just a recap of the options for surgery for the breast, uh, lumpectomy, radiation after the lumpectomy, or mastectomy, removing the breast or with or without reconstruction. And then we also always do surgery for the lymph nodes under the arm just to make sure that uh, there's no cancer has traveled to the lymph nodes. And I think I am gonna stop here. I think that's all I have for you guys today. Just really wanted to talk about what I did on a day-to-day -day basis and then present just those two cases to you. And let's see what questions you have for me. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Aruwari. There are some questions in the okay. chat box. If you have um, time to look okay. at some of those with us, that would be great. All right, let me see, where is it? You can also stop sharing your screen if that makes it easier to look at the chat box. Yeah, I think so. All right, here it goes. So, why does smoking cause breast abscesses? That is a good question. So what happens uh, with nicotine? Uh, we found uh, nicotine disrupts the oxygen uh, delivery to the tissues of the breast. So it makes 
people more prone to infections of the breast. Um, and this is, this is real and it's actually pretty serious. So a lot of uh, plastic surgeons, if it's not a breast cancer surgery or something not, um, uh, not um, the word is not serious, uh, that's not emergent. If it's not an emergent uh, surgery, plastic surgeons will not do any type of plastic surgery on a patient if they smoke because the smoking increases the risk for implant failure, increases the risk for infections and non-healing, et cetera. But it's really because of the lack of oxygen delivery because of what the nicotine does. Um, did I miss something up here? What causes bloody discharge in one? Oh, what causes bloody discharge? I think I saw in one breast. Um, bloody discharge is uh, usually as a result of introductal papillomas, which is a tiny, tiny lump that a lot of times we cannot feel that um, grows within the milk duct close to the nipple. And it blocks the milk duct so that fluid flows outwards instead of going the opposite way. So the fluid that we end up seeing a lot of times is the bloody discharge. Um, does breastfeeding help lower the risk of breast cancer? Yes, yeah, statistically it does. Uh, I don't like telling people that because I do see a lot of women who have breastfed who still develop breast cancer. But yes, it's one of the things that I listed as causing uh, breast cancer. Do hormones affect the growth of fibroadenomas? Uh, that's a good question. We think the reason fibroadenomas are more common in the younger age group is because that's the period when the breasts are going through so much change, you no know, puberty and growth. Um, but some studies have shown that girls that are on birth control can have a reversal of the growth of the fibroadenoma. I haven't seen it happen. You know, we've tried it with some people that don't want surgery for the fibroadenomas. They've tried going on birth control to see if it helped, but it didn't. But there are some studies that suggest that it might. Um, how does pregnancy lower the risk of breast cancer? So it's not pregnancy per se. It's, um, it's the hormonal changes that come along with pregnancy. So being pregnant um, increases the amount of estrogens and a lot of times the benefit is not immediate. It's later on in, in life that we know that if you've been pregnant, but it depends on when you were pregnant. If you're pregnant at a young age, it protects you against breast cancer. But if the pregnancy is after the age of 30, it does not protect you. So timing is important for that. Are there concerns uh, with infections after breast reconstruction? Absolutely. Anytime you're talking about uh, doing any kind of big surgery um, or any surgeries in general, it's always a risk of infection, even just regular mastectomy. But with the reconstruction, especially if we're using breast implants, because we're putting a foreign material into the body, the body can reject it and the form of rejection is infection. So yes, we give a lot of antibiotics for the surgery. So women are on antibiotics for about a couple of weeks afterwards to decrease the risk of infections. It can happen, but it's more common in women who smoke or women who are diabetics, because again, um, those women have um, poor healing because of their um, comorbidity. Uh, would removing muscle to use in breast reconstruction affect the ability to do physical activity? Yes, yes, yes. If they are taking the belly muscle, you can't do sit-ups anymore. Um, so that's usually a negative. And the plastic surgeon presents all of this to the patients. And I have some women that are young and healthy and really active that decide against that particular type of reconstruction because you know they walk out all the time and they want to continue to do their sit-ups and whatnot. So that would. Does removing tissues, uh, specifically muscles from the stomach lead to other adverse health, health outcomes? Not of just really the sit-ups, but otherwise, no. Uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of women who are heavy or overweight or obese, 
they use that as an opportunity to have a tummy tuck. So um, no adverse effects. What course of action do you take if the cancer spreads to the lymph nodes? Uh, if the cancer spreads to the lymph nodes and we worry that it may have gone to other places, it may have metastasized to the most common places, we worry about for breast cancers, the liver, the lungs, the bones. So we usually add chemotherapy in that situation because chemotherapy is the only thing that has the ability to treat a breast cancer that has gone to the other organs. Um, the surgery and radiation really manage surgery when it's in the breast. I'm sorry, what manage breast cancer when it's in the breast. But once it's gone outside of the breast, chemo becomes part of the treatment. Uh, let's see. Does a mastectomy guarantee that the cancer will not return? No, we don't give any guarantees. Uh, I can tell you that a mastectomy removes about 97% of breast tissue, but we cannot remove 100% of breast tissue just because we have so much breast tissue. Breast tissue goes all the way up to the collarbone. It goes all the way under the arm and we take as much of it out as possible, but there's always a small percentage that's remaining. So, so, so long as there's breast tissue remaining, there is a small chance of developing another breast cancer. That risk is really low. So I would say for women who have preventative or prophylactic mastectomies, uh, we decrease their risk by about 95 to 97%, but not 100. But 95 to 97 is pretty good though. Um, when do, when does the surgical, wait, when you do a surgical biopsy, is that essentially like a lumpectomy? Yes, it is, absolutely. But we call it different things. For insurance reasons, so when you go in to remove a lump that's not cancer, we call it a breast biopsy or an excisional breast biopsy. When you do a removal for breast cancer, we call it a lumpectomy. And we code it different because insurance will pay differently for cancer versus non-cancer. Don't ask me why, because it's the same exact surgery, but that's the world we live in. Um, can you... Talk more about why chemo affects pregnancy. So, yes. Um, so, we don't typically give chemo during pregnancy, especially the, during the second trimester of pregnancy, because that is when that's when the fetus is going through a lot of developmental changes. So, chemo can affect that. So it, we, it leads to a lot of birth defects. A lot of times, so chemo and radiation, we like to wait till after the woman has delivered her baby to do that. But um, it can affect fertility because the ovaries make eggs, as you know, and um, the chemo affects rapidly dividing cells and the ovaries, that's what they are. They're making eggs, they're rapidly dividing. So chemo affects the ovaries and makes them not active or kills off some of those cells. So a woman is unable to get pregnant because you know you need the ovaries to get pregnant. Um, can you perform a total mastectomy and then stretch the skin by injecting fluid into it to prepare the area for implant? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we call that putting in a tissue expander. I did not want to complicate the talk. That's why I didn't have it in, but yes. Uh, if someone, uh, like I actually have a patient who I did a mastectomy on like five years ago, and now she decided that she wants to have reconstruction. So yes, the plastic surgeon would just reopen that mastectomy incision and put in what we call a, a tissue expander, which is a saline bag, a flattened saline bag. And then what they do is start to inject saline slowly um, into the bag through a port in the skin. And as, the, as you inject it progressively, weekly, the skin starts to stretch. It stretches it so much so that then we can then fit in a B cup, a C cup, or whatever it is that they decided into it. So yes, reconstruction can be done after the fact with implants. 
but because we didn't leave enough skin, we'd have to stretch it out to put in the implants. Are you the one performing the breast implant surgery? Refer to plastic surgeon. I work together with plastic surgeons. So I, I'm an oncologic breast surgeon. So I do the cancer part and the plastic surgeons do the pretty part. What is the course of action if the cancer returns even after a mastectomy? Um, depending on what we are seeing, if it's a cancer that recurred in the area where we do, did the mastectomy, then we would remove it. We still want to remove that area because uh, we don't want to leave the, the cancer there. We usually would add radiation if the patient hasn't already been radiated. And uh, a lot of times we'll also do chemo. If the cancer returns and it returns elsewhere, in the bones, in the brain, on the liver, then it's chemo at that point. And a lot of times we call that stage four breast cancer and the survival is pretty low for that type of advanced breast cancer, but we do what we can to um, keep them comfortable and alive for as long as possible at that point. What is your favorite part about your job? You know, my favorite part is that I get to do surgery. Surgery is a lot of fun. Every surgeon will tell you that that is their absolute favorite part is being in the operating room. So that's my favorite part. But the part of the reason I chose this and didn't stick with just general surgery is because I like that connection with my patients. So my husband is a psychiatrist and a lot of times I feel like I'm a psychiatrist. I feel like I'm an internist and a surgeon all wrapped up in one because I can sit in the office with my patients. We can do a cancer talk for an hour long. We can hold their hands. I can give them hugs, you know, cry with them, bond with them. And then I can go to surgery and do the fun part. So to me, it's kind of fun to be able to do a little bit of, of that. And as opposed to a general surgeon who does an appendectomy and you never ever see your patients again. You, know, you take out the appendix and they're gone, that's it. I continue to see my patients every year. Um, I see them for about five to 10 years. Some patients decide that they want to keep coming to see me because it's kind of like a security blanket. So it's, it's good. We, you know, you just build a lot of really great relationships with the patients. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Arwari, for such a wonderful presentation and for taking the time to answer all of our questions. We really, You're really welcome. appreciate it. You are so welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I want to get, get a picture for my Instagram thing on here. <laughs> catch a picture of that. For everyone watching, yes. um, the Google form has been posted in the chat box and will be posted in the description of this video shortly. Please fill that out within the next 30 minutes for us to receive verification of your attendance. And please remember that the April roundup will begin this coming Friday evening at 11.59 p.m. Eastern and will end this Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern as well. To learn more about that, please refer to our Roundup tab on our website or our Instagram highlight. And once again, thank you so, so much for a wonderful presentation. You're we so really welcome, Sophia. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Have